Today, it's the start of a three-part series of episodes as we look back over 2023 and bring to you highlights from the top 12 shows of 2023. Today, we start at number 12. We'll work down to number nine. And in the following shows, we'll eventually get down to the number one show of 2023. Today, it shows rank 12 through nine on this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. everyone, Justin Mills here with the Working Ranch Radio Show. We're glad to have you tune in and joining us on our program. Yeah, as we have done this last year, we're going to do it again this year and review and look at the top 12 shows of 2023. And by no means is that said to diminish any of the other shows, because I'll tell you, it took me a long time to figure out what and narrow it down to the top 12 shows, because we had a lot of great episodes, a lot of great guests that talked on topics that are extremely and always relevant to the ranching industry. So there'll be some honorable mentions that I'll also talk about throughout the show as well as we look at that. But nevertheless, we will be starting today and uh, starting at number 12 and working down to number nine. Now, it's quite hard, as I said, to do that. And if you're wondering kind of how I've come up with that list, well, it was a, a variety of ways that we look at that. First of all, we can look at first week downloads and how a show did in the first week that it aired. Also, first month total downloads and then all time total downloads. However, the Working Ranch Radio show has continued to grow exponentially and so with that we can't always just look at downloads in some ways because for example a year ago first week downloads for a show it wasn't uncommon at all for a show to have about 1300 first week downloads today uh, about 12 months later we're about 2000 downloads for a first week download so as the show continues to grow we have to keep that into perspective but at the same time look at the uh, topics that we covered and putting all of that into perspective. So that's kind of how it all came together, just in case you're wondering on that. We'll, and we're going to get into see, getting to our number 12 one in just a moment. But first, before we did that, I did want to mention that later on in the show, we will have the Captain Tim O'Byrne stopping by for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. And meteorologist Don Day will also be checking in with us on a look at our long-term weather as he's telling us that, uh, yeah, we're going to start to really see that El Nino pattern of weather show up. You'll find out about it as we hear from him later on in the show. Well, let's get it kicked off. As we start with the episode ranked number 12 for 2023, it was the guest I had a privilege of interviewing twice, and it was Steve Cody as our episode that aired on July 29th of 2023, episode 128, entitled Stockmanship with Steve Cody, Getting a Herd Started Correctly. And let's drop in now on part of that show from episode 128. When you approach a herd uh, or animals and a head goes up in the air, that animal's telling you, if you come any closer, I'm going to take off. And so these animals, you need, these are more sensitive ones in a group. And oftentimes when you come across the animals, and even in a, even in a feedlot somewhere or a, big, a small pasture, they'll be on the fringe of the, uh, mm-hmm. of the bunch. And so with those animals, those are the ones you've got to concentrate on first. And I fix those. Sometimes you can't because you don't have the knowledge on how to do that yet. Uh, so you can move those animals aside, put them in another pen or whatever. Uh, for a while until you work some other animals and get some more experience. But once that head goes, say you've got a bunch of 50 or whatever it is on the range and they're together um, or fairly close together, then once that head goes up in the air, you must stop. If you keep coming, they're going to take off or do something else and everybody else will too. And then you haven't won anything. And then you got to go get them. So once that head goes up, and this is a really old technique, actually wildlife photographers have used it forever is that you're going to stop and maybe back up a step and wait for calmness. Once their heads go down or, or once they go to grazing, then you can approach again. But your approach is important. It's got to be in straight lines. And when you approach to get closer, then what you want to do is that line should that you're riding or walking should always take you past the animals. And then if a head goes up again, and it will, then you need to stop and do the same thing. And sometimes with some herds, it takes 20 minutes or so of doing this. And, and riders say, I'm not doing nothing. Well, you're doing a whole lot because this is going to affect the animals from then on. And uh, so it's well worth the time. If you get a bad start to a herd, say you just get behind them and then yell, which some guys do, 
and get them to go someplace, you're not going to have a good drive. I can guarantee that. But if you get a good start and you do a few things right and few wrong things, like riding too far behind or too much behind, yelling and racing around, <clears throat> riding up the sides, mm -hmm. then you're set up for a successful day. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've got a, a fairly calm herd, calm animals and they're bedded down, you want to bump those animals up. And I always approach them uh, and they'll let you get pretty close before they stand them. As soon as they start standing up, then I back off and get each animal up and ready and do that to cows and calves. And they're going to stretch and, and dung and urinate. And what you're doing is getting them all ready for going somewhere. And then you can move cows to calves or calves to cows, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't think it matters. Yeah. So... Once I've got them gathered together quietly, and you can ride straight lines in one way and straight lines another to get them to come together, then I start the herd, and I'm close enough to them, then I start the herd with as little movement from me as is needed to get that herd to start drifting. And once the herd gets going, it, it, a lot of guys get excited because they're not going towards the gate. Well, let's don't give them that at first. Let them choose direction but you're just deciding that they need to move. And uh, a lot of times, if they're sensitive ones, a herd might trot off uh, and some animals go to the front. And in that case, what I do is, uh, and this is very important to know, is the, the rider needs to ride behind the lead cow so she can't see him. In other words, if you can't see her eyes, she can't see you. And so that's going to, because cows want to see what's pressuring them, right? and they want it really bad, then doing that will prompt the cow to slow and turn her head and look at you. And when she does that, you slow and stop, maybe back up a step or two. And then she's going to straighten out and probably keep on going. And then I would fall back behind. Now, when you follow cattle, the lead cattle like that, you need to, to go slower than they're going and keep yourself if they move you want to keep yourself directly behind and like i said slower than they're going that's really important and that's how i deal with animals that want to take off if you chase them they're just going to keep running mm -hmm. and then later on when the herd calms down if, if they're going i'm going to want to ride up the sides and they should slow now it takes maybe three or four times of that before they're really good at slowing and stopping and when they get good at slowing like that i turn around and ride back down the sides mm -hmm. and that should speed them up or or if they're standing still it should make them walk after that i'm going to start working on getting some direction control and and you want to keep them together a lot of times you, you have animals that want to uh, spread out and go this way and that way and the other thing so you need to keep the sides tucked in and uh, then I start working on, well, will you turn to the left or, or turn to the right? And if you want them to turn to the right, for instance, then you're going to ride straight, straight out to the left. And a lot of guys have a lot of trouble doing that. Mm -hmm. They want to move up and over, and that's not – and they say, well, she's so far away. Well, I said, she's that distance because that's where she's comfortable with you. And so if you just will go straight – and you need to practice that and get good at it. Not just get the cause calm but and trusting, but to get yourself so you're handy at doing all this stuff. And then when you really need to do that, then you can. Mm -hmm. And uh, then what I do, usually do, and it varies between herds, but I want to make sure that they speed up. If I want a herd, herds being kind of pokey, then I work the middle more. And then, you know, and, and you get maybe, sometimes you even have to pick up a little bit of a trot, but usually you don't have to go any faster than that. And get the middle, you're getting closer to the lead cow when you're doing that and get them to speed up and get them to slow down. And all this stuff is really valuable on the range, especially when you've got a steep downhill and the cows look like that way is closed or you're going to a steep uphill. Mm -hmm. Well, Steve, the next step in this gather, of course, would be when we get to the corrals or approaching the corrals. And that always seems to be a point in time that can create a lot of frustration or confusion as well, uh, not only amongst the riders, but with the cows. And we see things kind of tune up and tense up just a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about taking cows into the corrals. I've done some uh, schools where, like in one case, a gal said, well, I just can't get those cows in the corral. They will not go in there, just stop at the gate or, you know, some of them will run through, the others will take off and go back. And so when I started, I said, okay. And once I started working the cattle, I, I was just working them in the field. And those are the things that I was doing. I'm getting to speed up. You want their attention on you, all of them, and uh, getting them to turn a little better and to slow down when I go up the sides and speed up when I go down the sides, in other words, against the direction that they're going. And she came out and tugged on my shirt. She said, well, I, my problem is I can't get them in the corral gate. But her idea and a lot of people's ideas is that the problem's 
you know, getting them in the corral and it isn't. The problem is, is they can't take the pressure of the confinement of the corral and the gate posts uh, with your pressure also. Mm-hmm. And so you, the way I fix that is to, to make sure they're better at taking my pressure and then they'll go in the corral. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you can help them go in the corral too, uh, or through a gate or whatever. Um, is they'll surround the cattle when they got them going through the gate. And that's that's when calves start breaking back or cows too. Um, you just need to keep a straight line behind uh, and the middle person pressure and the outside uh, people guide, or you need to stop pressuring from behind and go up to the front and then pressure uh, the lead animals to go in. And that way, the rest of the bunch can see what's pressuring them and where they're going. And that makes it easier. It helps cattle get into a crowd when you're doing that or through a gate or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I don't look at that going through the gate as a problem getting in the crowd, but it's a problem taking pressure. So, mm-hmm. Steve, a quick question here as you were talking about starting and driving this herd. And I know we've seen the use of drones and a lot of this uh, stockmanship and to get a good visual view of that. If you were a bird's eye view of what a, a herd that was started well would look like, what would that look like? Well, some people ask me about the shape of a herd and things like that, and and the way to keep them mothered up is to line them out, um, which I don't agree with. But um, a herd's going to take the shape it takes. But what you're going to see is all the animals are calm, uh, and nobody's looking at going their own direction or leaving the herd, and they're all just waiting for you. And when you prompt them to go, it's pretty easy to get them started and when you want them to slow down all you do is relax and the herd slows down a herd that drives well will do all those things that i was talking about they sh- and they should go uphill and downhill and that's just a portion of episode 128 with guest steve cody as we were talking about getting a herd started correctly a lot of great things that he touched on in that episode and if you're interested in another show that we did on stockmanship i would encourage you to go check out episode 135 that's also on my honorable mention list that aired in september of this past year that was on keeping fall cow calf work stress to a low and steve is very very knowledgeable on low stress cattle handling if you're interested in finding out more about him or his resources that he has available you can go to his website at codystockmanship.com that's cody is spelled c-o-t-e you go to his website codystockmanship.com and you can find out more from there but it was episode 128 that hit the number 12 spot for 2023 stick with us we're going to get into number 11 when we come back it's on succession planning you'll find out what that show was when we return on the working ranch radio show there are lots of nutrition tubs out there but none can match the true blue commitment of vitalix our tubs offer you the most concentrated nutrition at the lowest cost per day that means more profit for your operation and improved performance for your cow herd In fact, research shows Vitalix tubs increase feed efficiency by 20% while boosting conception rates, herd health, and weaning weights. Learn more at Vitalix.com. Vitalix, the true blue tub. Welcome back. This is the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills, and we are counting down the top 12 shows of 2023. Today's program will offer you the shows ranked number 12 all the way down to number 9. So let's get into what was the show ranked number 11 in 2023. It was episode 130 that aired in August of this past year entitled Ranch Succession Plan, Your Legacy. My guest for that show was Dan Childs with the Noble Research. Research Institute. He serves there as an ag economist and also a consultant. But I know if you've listened for any time on my show, you know that uh, succession planning and passing these ranches on to the next generation is very, very important. It was a great conversation that we had with Dan Childs on that. So let's dip into episode 130 entitled Ranch Succession Plan, Your Legacy. You know, there there's a huge difference in, you know, transferring assets to the next generation versus transferring a business. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot longer. It takes a lot of planning to transition that business to where you want it to be successful. You know, as you accurately mentioned there, many of the owners uh, and operators today have put a lot of blood, sweat into these operations and wise decisions to get them where they are today. And it's hard to give those the reins up to someone that hadn't went through that much effort as you as you mentioned Mm -hmm. so our our program here today is we've kind of intro this and kind of set the foundation for what we're going to be talking about and a little for discussion here 
is going through about seven steps that you guys have put together in some ways or some things for considerations when folks are looking at some succession type of planning. The first one I'm going to start out here, and I, and I find this interesting because I think this ultimately is a very pivotal point in the succession planning, is that is to think about your legacy. What are you wanting to leave behind? That is step one, and I, I feel that really is very foundational and very pivotal to start off with. Well, you know, I think all of us as ranch owners want to provide a blessing as a legacy to our to the next generation and to our lives and and not a burden. And so I, I think that's the process we have to think through is is that is not binding the next generation to something that that we feel near and dear hearts. You know, we, we want to bless them. And not burden. We say, well, you can't, you know, you can't sell any land or you have to do this. Or we, we tend to want to manage the operation from the grave. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I, I, I wanted to say often, but I'll just say sometimes that really creates a burden. Uh, it, it limits flexibility and creativity in the next generation that uh, may, may need it in order to survive. And so that legacy that we want to, to leave, I think, for most of us is a blessing. And and sometimes it's hard to distinguish between that legacy of a blessing and a, and a burden just because we don't want anything to happen to the operation. We've operated it successfully. But, you know, if we lived another 40 years, you, you know, we may not be successful doing the same thing we've done for the last 40. Mm-hmm. So then it moves us into the second thing. And as I went through these seven things, I, I find that it's interesting because they're almost purposely, well, I know they're purposely in order because the next thing is to have tough conversations. And I can, and I come to that point really from two sides. I've got my family side where my folks have passed away and realizing the importance that some of these tough conversations need to happen now because they won't happen in, in, in a very good way once the parents are gone. And I think those tough conversations are good for both sides it's good for the kids it's good for the parents all in all but at the same time it's a tough conversation you know just as you started the radio broadcast today justin you you kind of told your audience well this is what we're going to talk about today and you set somewhat of what their expectations are going to be mm-hmm. for this radio broadcast and and the same thing applies when we're thinking about that transition is is if if we can help manage the next generation's expectations of of what's going to happen in the future then there's a, a much likelier chance of success and because if if you've got children or grandchildren that don't want to have any any part of the ranching operation the sooner you know that, the better, because you, you, may, you may have said, well, you know, I got three grandsons and, you know, they all have fun when they come and they enjoy being here. But it's really hard in today's work environment to attract these young kids back to a ranch where, you know, it may be 20, 30, 50 miles from, you know, from the nearest Walmart and these sons and daughters get married and sometimes their spouses have different ideas and you've got to, you've got to respect that. And so if you can have that conversation earlier rather than later, it will give you much more planning time Mm -hmm. to, to address some maybe issues that you didn't think, think you had. And, and so early communication, often communication, and, and we encourage that, that communication period not to, not to happen at, well, everybody's home at Christmas. So mm-hmm. we'll, we'll talk about what's going to happen to the ranch. And, and usually that's not a good time mm-hmm. to have those kind of conversations. It, it's best just to schedule one and I- invite some, you, you know, your family either to the ranch. You can have it off site, but communication is, is so important and planning that transition of the ranch to the next generation. 
Mm -hmm. Dan, as you were talking about that, before we get into the next step that we're going to be looking at, I, just a, a side note on that. And, and when we talk about having those tough conversations, I think part of that also is what are some realistic expectations that need to come out in those tough conversations? That in itself needs to be considered. I, I guess one of the things I think about is that if the default is to split the place up equally among the siblings, that may not always be the best from a from a management element for that operation so there has to be some realistic conversations realistic expectations in those tough conversations that's a great point justin and and i always try to remind the ranchers i work with that are planning a transition of the ranch to to realize that even though maybe a a decision is made are in the in the communication process that sometimes hard decisions, as you mentioned, have to be made. But if if mom and dad makes those decisions, the heirs, kids, grandkids may not exactly really like that, but they will respect it. Yep. And so mom and dad, you know, really has a responsibility when when there's like undivided interest concerns or who gets this or who gets that. If there's not one heir that's going to really take on the whole op operation. And so if mom and dad can just make those hard decisions while they're alive, the kids may not like it, but they will respect it. Mm -hmm. And too many times I've seen siblings try to make those decisions on their own and, and wind up really only speaking to each other through their attorneys for the rest of their lives. And that's such a sad situation. And it gets back to what we mentioned earlier about, I think all parents want to bless their heirs and not burden them. And so that's a result of those, those communication efforts, those having those hard decisions and, and trying to manage the expectations of the next generation or, or two. And so it's just, paramount, I mm -hmm. think, for a su successful transition plan to include that communication piece early on mm -hmm. a a if they can. Yeah. So, Yep, very well said. And I, th I think these tough conversations might have more of an impact on the legacy, the first thing we talked about, too. And that was just a portion of the conversation that we had in episode 130 entitled Ranch Succession Plan, Your Legacy with Dan Childs of the Noble Research Institute. And I'll tell you what, that title in itself has a lot to say that if you want your legacy to be that of a positive memory, I think a lot of it is going to really come back to your succession planning with your ranching operation and, and your estate just in general and uh, a great conversation like I said with Dan Child on episode 130 that was ranked number 11 in 2023 in our shows by the way the Noble Research Institute a, a place with a lot of resources there you can go to their website at noble.org well stay with us after the break what was the show ranked number 10 for 2023 well it was episode 103 we'll talk about it when we come back on the Working Ranch Radio Show Nothing delivers a better return on investment like cattle health. Set up the next generation for lifetime performance with Zinpro Avela 4. Achieve reproductive success in your herd with a 20% increased conception rate and a 16-day tighter calving interval. Calves from cows supplemented with Zinpro have stronger immunity and 28 more pounds at weaning. Help protect your profits by partnering with Zinpro. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. We are counting down the top 12 shows of 2023. Today's show will focus on shows ranked 12 through 9, and we will cover the rest of them in the next two episodes. As we look at the show ranked at the number 10 spot, it was episode 103 that aired in January of this past year, entitled Raising Kids on the Ranch. My guest for that show was Alan Crockett, who is a ranching consultant and business coach. We've had him on for many other shows as well. He's a great resource. I appreciate his 
perspective on things as we talked about various different topics when it comes to raising kids on the ranch and how us as ranch families can handle that. Let's listen in on the number 10 show of 2023, episode 103, Raising Kids on the Ranch with my guest, Alan Crockett. As I was segueing here into that comment, mainly talking about, you know, parents' responsibilities or in terms of uh, how do we, how can we help them uh, with that, whether it's going to college or is it the parent's responsibility to pay for college or, and then at the same time you add on another layer to that is should we be compensating for their labor? How do we compensate for labor? You know, there's just, you can keep going with a lot of different things here, Alan. And what, and I know as you and I were talking, prepping for this show, it's like, then we revert back to, well, how we were raised. And then that's a whole nother dialogue of how we treat kids too. Yeah. Obviously today we're living in a different world than what, than what we were raised. And I don't care if you're 30 years old or 80 years old, it's a different world today than it was even 10, 15 years ago. It's, it's changing fast all around us. So that we can't just say, well, this is the way I was raised, so this is the way I'm going to raise my kids. I think I think we can look at some of the positive things in the way we were raised and take those and apply them in the way we, we raise our kids. But at the same time, the world is changing and, and society is changing, and our kids need to be able to adapt to that also. As far as college, I guess we're going to open a big can of worms <laughs> yeah, on this one because yeah. I'm sure there's all kinds of opinions out there. Yes, it's the parent's responsibility to pay for college, or no, it's not the parent's responsibility. It's their own responsibility. And I think we have a responsibility to teach our ki- our children, as I said earlier, a, a good work ethic, to be honest, to treat others with respect, and, and, and those kinds of things. But when they turn 18, they're adults now, and so... I think it's time that they take some responsibility on and, and if they've done well in high school and got good grades or or if they have some athletic potential and they can get an athletic scholarship, there's other things that they can do to help pay for college that doesn't need to drain mom and dad. You know, I think kids need to, to step up and take some responsibility there. And again, we're probably opening a can of worms <laughs> and maybe I'm being a little bit vague, but but once they turn 18, they're, they're adults and and we should treat them like that, and and they should take responsibility for their actions and and what they're going to do, whether that's college or a, a trade school or a vocational school, whatever it is. That's that's kind of on them at that point in time. And if we need to help out now and then, well, maybe we do. But but yeah, I, 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 that's my opinion. Yeah, well, I can it, see probably some of our listeners, their <laughs> eyes are rolling as we yeah. as we say that. <laughs> well, and I guess you know some of this I feel as farms and ranches already it's as we've talked about here on, on our show quite often i mean i'm a big proponent of trying to get our ranches to a point to where we're thinking as a business and we're operating as a profitable business but it's not like we got so much for some for some that there's so much profit out there that said okay kids you want to go to a private college at forty thousand a year you know do it they can i mean the state colleges or junior colleges and even those to some extent might put a strain on mom and dad to have to pay for that and so that's where some of this is is, is sort of stemming from. And, and maybe I jumped the gun a little bit as we were talking about college. Let's let's go back and talk about when they're when they're in the home and we've got labor. Uh, they're they're helping out on the ranch. And uh, boy, there's there's again, that's maybe a whole nother can of worms that we're getting into there. But I think we need to probably go through some different avenues there in terms of how do we compensate for labor? Should we compensate for labor? And from a from a ranching perspective, and I've got some some opinions on this. I guess as well. How do we handle these kids in terms of using their labor as a, a learning mechanism in in this classroom of life? You know that that's that's really great that, that we get to have this discussion, Justin. To me, it's um, you know, and you and you mentioned it early on when you started talking there. You know, we're, we're trying more and more to treat this ranch like a business and and have it generate a profit, and and it should be a business and. An, and in order to be a viable business, it needs to generate a profit. So if it's generating profit, and that should be on top of the salary that we pay ourselves as ranch owners and operators, but then there comes a time with the kids, well, should we pay the kids? Should we not pay them? And right up front before I dive in, I'll, I'll tell you, I've seen, I've seen both sides of this uh, in the extreme. I've seen it where kids don't get anything because – you know, you live here, and so you work to, to live here. And, and that's weekends after school, summer vacations, Christmas break, spring break, et cetera. You know, that's, that's just part of it. And, and then you look at kids going to school, you know, being raised in the city. Well, you know, they don't work like kids do 
like that. They don't have to work every day after school and, and go do a bunch of chores or before school. Weekends and holidays and, and summer breaks are not spent on long hours in a saddle or building fence and, and et cetera. I've seen the other extreme where I knew a guy that from the from the time his kids were in their early teens, he paid them. But in paying them, he also took out Social Security tax and and all of them treated him just like a regular employee. And they were they were paid by the hour with the standard deductions that go to the government and everything else. And 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 most of us fall someplace in between those two extremes. But I've seen both extremes. I've seen it where the kids get to run some cows Mm -hmm. and the calves are sold and and the calf check goes to the kids and the kids don't have to pay any expenses, uh, supplement feed, health, vaccines, vet check, any of that kind of stuff. They don't pay. It's included, but they work for that. And so I guess someplace in there, there, there's a happy medium that both the business can afford and can do and probably ought to do, but at the same time, teach the kids some financial responsibility of what to do with that calf check when they get it and how to invest it and and those kinds of things. So if we're going to say, okay, kids, we're not paying for your college, but yet you have to work here and you don't get paid for working here, well, where's the motivation to work there, number one? And certainly, where's the motivation to come back after college and, and be part of that kind of an operation? Yeah. As you and I were prepping for this show, and, and I had talked to you the week before, um, one of the basis or, or common things that we talked in conversation was a book that I know I've heard you reference many, many times uh, as I've heard you talk with folks, uh, and it's Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert uh, Kiyosaki. And you've referenced it quite a bit and when when i went through that book as i come away from that book i realized that as parents of children and again this could probably be in any setting but it, as ranch kids as well where they do have some access to making money whether it's through 4-h or or, or ffa market animals and projects that they might have i realized that maybe some of some of my intense focus of just really hard driving towards boy you guys really need to work hard and and you shouldn't have to be told everything to do you find things to do and while that is all still good and fine i believe i wasn't probably focusing in some other areas and that was some of the financial savviness that we should use this classroom to get these kids into and that book is probably something to me that really shown a big light on a deficit that i may be doing with my kids of not really getting them to that point of knowing the difference between an asset and a liability and how they can take their money and make it work for them yeah i think that's that's a really good comment justin it uh you know we we teach our kids how to how to catch a horse and how to put a saddle on him and how to ride. And we teach them how to, how to doctor a calf, you know, in the beginning, maybe they're that branding. They're the, they're the kid that gets to stick a needle in and, and, you know, give a vaccine. And then later on they get a little bit bigger and they get to hold them down and, and then a little bit bigger, they get to start dragging calves and, and eventually maybe they get to put, put the brand on and, and all of those things come and, and we teach them all of those kinds of things, but we don't teach them how to read a cash flow. We don't teach them how to understand a gross margin. We don't teach them what a good investment looks like. And as as you referenced Kiyosaki, you know, the difference between an asset and a liability and 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 his definition, you know, an asset puts money into your pocket, a liability takes money out of your pocket. And and we don't really teach them those things. Uh, and we really ought to be doing that because the world that that they are growing up in is is a completely different world and we're seeing inflation again that that's been pretty easy to deal with until the last couple of years and it, and it's going way up again hopefully it never goes back to like what we saw in mm-hmm. in the early 80s and 18 and 20 and 22 percent interest rates on operating loans and those kinds of things but our kids need to have an understanding of finances and and money and and it's easy for kids to get credit cards, you know, teenagers, college kids, high school kids to get credit cards. It's easy for adults to get lots of credit cards. And if we're not careful, we just use those and all of a sudden we have a big balance on them. We can't pay it off. We don't know what to do. So all of that responsibility comes comes in not only from a business perspective, but also from a co- consumer uh, perspective and and making wise choices with with their money how they want to 
trade their life's energy for money and what that looks like. And when when we start looking at, you know, I, I worked this many hours for this much money or I did this much work for this much money, now I'm going to go take this money and go buy something with it. When we put that back into how much time it took us to, to make that money, it puts a little different perspective on things. And, and I think our kids need to understand that. Mm-hmm. That's the one place that we probably fall short more than any other place in agriculture is teaching our kids about finances, about money. Well, I'll tell you, that was just a very impactful show. Episode 103, Raising Kids on the Ranch with Alan Crockett, as we discussed uh, a lot of different things that I know all of us as ranching families that have kids growing up on the ranch have thought about, and I appreciated so much his advice and perspective on the topics that we talked about there. If you have kids and you're on a ranch, this is a show you want to go back and listen to. It was episode 103, Raising Kids on the Ranch with Alan Crockett. And I might mention that one of the shows that was first in line for honorable mention was a show that I did have on with Alan, where we talked about next year's profit, depending on proactive year in planning. That was a show that aired in November this past year. A great episode with him as well. That was one of the shows I had on my honorable mention list. We'll stay with us coming up. We're going to get into the show ranked number nine. It was one that aired more recently. We'll talk about it when we return on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show as we are counting down the top 12 shows of 2023. Today's show is featuring the shows ranked 12 through 9. And I've also thrown in a few honorable mentions, which I will do from time to time. But as we look now at the show ranked number 9, it was a show that aired recently. In fact, it was in December of this year. Episode 145 entitled Perspective from Dr. Neville Spear for those in the cattle biz. And it was basically a show about things if you're in the cattle biz might want to tune in and listen in on this one dr spear is very recognized and very respected in our cattle industry for his perspective on things and it was a great opportunity to sit down with him and talk about a variety of topics and we started in on what is this cattle herd doing take a listen as you listen in neville as you talked about that you identified some things that might be holding back this herd growth that we thought might be starting to happen by now but is not Uh, One of those, of course, a couple of those things would be drought that the Southern Plains had this last year. Of course, we see interest rates that's affecting everybody in the industry. But is there anything else? I feel to me, and maybe it's because I focused on it on some of our shows here on our program of just folks being cautious. The, the, The prices are coming up. That's great. But be cautious as you move forward here with how you spend those extra proceeds. Do you think there's anything else that's psychological? or or fundamentally holding some of this growth back and and folks uh, wanting to really keep things and and build back their herds? Well, you know, it's interesting to me, and I think it's a great point. There's there's just so much uncertainty surrounding the economy in general. I don't care where you go, right? It's it's been interest rates and you know, are we yeah. are we going to have inflation? Are we going to have a recession? And and it's it's just been kind of dark and and it's been a pretty long two year grind here. Is what I what I would call the great reset as we go through interest rate reset, and and I think that plays on everyone's psyche regardless of who you are. Right, all kinds of businesses they're not you know, not investing because it's uncertain. And I think that that plays into producer mentality. But I'll tell you, I think the biggest thing, regardless of business, it's just ultimately it comes down to grass and hay. Mm -hmm. And you want a little bit of a buffer before you say, you know what, we're going to start keeping more cows and more heifers and you know, if you kind of look back, most of the times we get into big sell offs, it's because of weather. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we're starting to now see some bread cow prices uh, uh, in our neck of the woods up here. I'm up in the northern northeastern Wyoming and some of the sale barns, some of the uh, purebred registered outfits are now having getting some cattle moving across. Uh, You know, there's always that hold period from when calves sell in the summer and fall. And then there's kind of a dead spot in there. Now we're starting to see some of these bread cows moving across the auction block a little bit. Bread heifers, for example, thirty five hundred dollars. Is there... 
I mean, that in itself, uh, is there any concern with, with some of that as far as guys looking at that and saying, boy, I don't know, I've never paid that much for a cow in my life. Yeah, I think there's, that is part of it. And, uh, you, you know, in, in either way, right. Is it, I'm, I'm going to buy that bread heifer and, or we can look at it the other way too, Justin is boy, that heifer is worth a lot of money, you know, being sold as a feeder animal mm-hmm. and, yeah. uh, you know, however you yeah. want to look at it, we've kind of had to readjust here and boy, it's been a pretty fast run. Mm-hmm in terms of like total dollar values. And I, and, and I get it. Um, you can think about kind of your, your margins and all of that, but I don't think people really think of it generally that way. It's just, there's a lot of money on the table. And, and, and by the way, I think one of the uncertainties in this is, and I used, I wrote about this, you, you know, kind of last big cycle is, is that heifer or that cow that we purchased, is she a cash trap? Right. Yeah. Am I going to get stuck? Because I want to make sure that we kind of get the all clear before I really <laughs> dig in and start rebuilding. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. You know, you brought up a really good point there. And that is the fact that these market animals are such so high value, too, that that really is really I probably putting as much pressure as anything is is like, why would I keep these heifers back to grow them out and make a replacement when we're getting sixteen, eighteen hundred dollars right now as a, you know, five to six hundred pound cat that really these these market prices on these feeder calves really are pushing the point of of selling off even more no no question right i mean the, what the market's doing is creating an incentive to sell heifers and or cull cows and it it also looks a little different when you've got that kind of goody uh against a i don't know an eight and a half or nine percent operating note right mm-hmm. um yeah, uh, let's let's do it. Let's let's build some cash reserves. And I, I like to think I would hope most producers that are pretty business minded, they've learned their lesson, especially through the financial crisis. Mm-hmm. We've got to have working capital because and especially when interest rates are high, we don't want to get stuck without, you know, not enough cash on hand to kind of maintain the business. And whether that's the pickup dies, I've got to go replace it. And by the way, that costs a lot more than it yeah. used to, Yeah, right? You know, you don't just go buy a $40,000 pickup anymore. No. And um, I need some working capital for those kinds of emergencies. Mm-hmm. Now let's begin to look ahead for 2024. We already anticipate the what the market's sort of going to look like. But as, as you look ahead, what do you think are going to be some major factors that are going to paint the picture for 2024. Well, Justin, what I see coming is really an increasing emphasis on what I would call supply chain coordination, what have you, as numbers get tighter. And as we talked about earlier, right, that consumers continue to want beef and they're willing to pay for it. You have entities all along there that want to ensure they have the right cattle to produce the right kind of beef to sell to the Mm -hmm. right customers, which ultimately says to me that we are, you know, moving to more of this, that kind of a coordinated system. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but um, there's certainly some movement afoot in our business that's doing that kind of quietly and behind the scenes. And um, they just want to make sure that, right, we don't have stock outs. And, And so ultimately I see, that you're going to have players in this business that kind of line up cattle and you may participate in the business. And I think it, it begins to segregate the commodity minded people versus value added entities that are in, in the industry. Yeah. You've really started, if you look back in hindsight, you've really started to see that formulate over the last couple of three years, haven't you? Yeah, you really have. And and one of the things that I think is probably driving that or accelerating some of that is really the beef on dairy um, Mm -hmm. possibilities, right? Because all of a sudden feed yards are starting to understand, hey, I've got a consistent supply. Mm -hmm. That supply will never replace all of the native cattle and it's it will never be intended to. But boy, I can get I can line up like kinds of animals 
in a very consistent supply that's you know continuous year round. Um, interesting enough, those cattle are kind of <laughs> as one nutritionist explained to me, right? They're extended stay cattle. They stay in the feed yard a long time, but, and then they're very consistent coming out of the packing house. And, and so they make a, a consistent product. And so, Hey, let's take kind of some of those concepts yeah. and let's start to work in the, in the native side and the, in, in the beef side and start lining up cow herds to do the same kind of thing. Yeah. And that was just a portion of that conversation that we had with Dr. Neville Spear, getting his perspective on just a variety of topics for those of us in the cattle business. That was episode 145 as it aired in December of this year. And a great episode. I'd encourage you to go back and listen to not only getting his perspective of where we're at in the industry, both in marketing and numbers and just from the economist view, but also he shares with us his perspectives as we look ahead to 2020. That was episode 145 with Dr. Neville Spear. Well, we're going to put a break on the countdown for this episode, but when we come back, we're going to be joined by the captain, Tim O'Byrne, with this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents and hear from meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. Fascinated by our wild weather? Now you can learn, appreciate, and understand the weather in your own backyard with the new Tropo Rain Gauge. Having achieved the highest rating of any product reviewed by theweatherstationexperts.com, the Tropo boasts rugged durability, impeccable accuracy, and precision to the hundredth of an inch. Visit MeasureRain.com to order a Tropo today and use code RAINDAY, that's R-A-I-N-D-A-Y, for free shipping and 10% off. Go to Measure Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show as we're using this show and the following two episodes to finish out the year to bring you the top 12 episodes of 2023. And I said I had some some different programs that we had had throughout the year that I wanted to at least mention that I'd put on the honorable mention list, nevertheless. And earlier I talked about the show that was number 11 was episode 130 on Ranch Succession Plan, Your Legacy. Now, if you're kind of thinking along those lines, you want another show that that was somewhere in there. In fact, I referenced it on that show. It was a legal perspective on estate planning. It was with attorney Dal Houston. That was episode 115. And if that's something that you're thinking about, or it's at the top of your mind a little bit, I would encourage you to go back and listen to episode 115, that legal perspective on estate planning. Now, one other thing that I just wanted to hit, and I meant to do this at the very front end of the show, because if you listened last week, I was telling you that this week we were going to be doing an interview and sharing that with you with Dr. Ty Lawrence on beef on dairy, a subject that's really coming to the forefront and a lot of us are hearing about and I do have a lot of questions on. However, that interview had to be postponed and we've rescheduled that. So we're going to be having that show the second week of January. We'll be talking beef on dairy with Dr. Ty Lawrence. So be sure to tune in for that. Well, let's switch gears a bit here and the captain Tim O'Byrne is standing by. Let's check in for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. Hey, Justin. Hey, all you bovine nutrition delivery technicians and all you sale barn coffee addicts and all you good folks that are headed back home from visiting our wonderful, welcoming city, Las Vegas, Nevada for NFR. Safe travels. Hope you had a great time. Hit some good cowboy Christmases. There's a song on the radio right now called Dirt Cheap by Cody Johnson, and the lyrics are by Josh Phillips. And all you tough guys out there, I want you to go and find a spot maybe in the tack room and uh, find that on your phone, and you listen to that song. And I'll tell you what, uh, when one of your grandkids comes walking and say, Granddad, what's wrong with, are you crying? And you say, no, squirt, it's just my allergies. Now run along and get started on chores. After you hear this song, I'll tell you what, you're going to find out just like I did, country music is very much alive and running and bucking in the horse pasture. And that's my two cents. Back to you, Justin. 
All right. Thanks, Captain. Yeah, my wife and I and some friends of ours, we had the opportunity to go down to Vegas and we were kind of like that, leaving leaving there with definitely needing a little bit more sleep than we had gotten the free, previous three nights. But it was fun. Always a great experience. In fact, I had the opportunity to catch up with the captain and his lovely wife, Christine, at Cowboy Christmas. And then we were able to get to the fifth round of the NFR. A lot of things happened on that one and a great a national finals rodeo that took place this last week in Las Vegas. And I might also add that the weather was pretty good while we were down there. And as we turn now and take a look at our long-term weather, joining us is meteorologist Don Day. And Don, we'll spend some time looking at our long-term weather. But first, to kind of look back, we've been getting some reports that those southern plains and parts of that areas of Kansas and Colorado has seen some pretty good moisture. In fact, as far west as New Mexico and Arizona. Take a look at the, this past week. We we finally got a storm to take a, a track and a route we haven't seen in a while. And that's across New Mexico, the southern half of Colorado, West Texas, and a and a good chunk of Kansas and and uh, portions of Oklahoma, uh, and even up into eastern areas of Nebraska, seeing some really good moisture. There uh, are areas in the northern New Mexico mountains that picked up words of two feet of snow. Uh, we have reports of one to three inches of rain on the plains, a cold rain that mixed with snow, but stayed mostly rain. Uh, across some of that winter wheat country where they really needed so that moisture. It's really good to see those southern areas to mm-hmm. pick up that moisture, something we haven't seen in a while. Yeah. And as you and I were talking before we went on air, we just the fact that in some ways we maybe haven't seen some of the weather patterns of El Nino like what we had expected. But what you are thinking as we look in the latter part of December, that is starting to develop in some of that was what we saw last week with that moisture. So we're starting to see that maybe in these next couple of parts of, or next couple of weeks in December to really see the El Nino weather pattern take shape. Yeah. And, and usually when you've got an El Nino season, it's usually the, this time of year that we start to see the patterns associated with it. Uh, and the storm that went across the Southern Plains is a signal of things to come because one thing that is, A a very telltale sign of an El Nino is the pattern across the southern tier of the U.S. getting more wet. Now, we've seen that along the Gulf Coast in the southeastern areas of the U.S., but we really haven't seen it yet in the desert southwest. We haven't seen it yet in California. Uh, But that that moisture we saw in southern Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, definitely an El Nino-like storm. And we see that pattern continuing. What is likely going to unfold as we go into Christmas week and New Year's week, is a a jet stream pattern that's going to take more of a southerly route. So this means California is finally going to get into the action, parts of the desert southwest, and across portions of the central and southern Rockies. And it'll be very wet, the southeastern parts of the United States, including Florida. And we're also going to see some stormy weather along the east coast and parts of the Midwest. However, another telltale signature of an El Nino pattern uh, it is, is going to be the Northern Plains really not seeing much action. Uh, mm-hmm. It does look like parts of Southern Canada, parts of the far Northern Rockies and the Northern Plains. It's kind of left high and dry in this pattern because you tend to see two storm tracks, one that's suppressed to the South and then one that's more directed further North. And the areas that are in between those patterns tend to be warmer and drier. And I think that's how the last two weeks of December will go wet in the South, some central areas drier in the north. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, it's not uncommon. Like you said, it's very predi- or it's been predictable in some elements that that's normally what we'd see through El Nino. So that's what we would come to expect. Don, appreciate you joining us here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Thanks for having me. You bet. And again, that is meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. You can find him each and every morning on his daily video podcast. You can find that by going to dayweather.com or just search on YouTube for Don Day's YouTube channel. We'll stay with us when we come back. We'll put a wrap on this week's episode when we return on the Working Ranch Radio Show.
Well, be sure to tune in next week. We're going to continue with our top 12 countdown of the shows of 2023. Today, we hit the shows ranked 12 through 9. Next week, we'll hit the shows ranked 8 through 5. And the following week, it'll be the top four shows of the year. And it's a pretty good way to kind of rejog your memory on some of those. And I can guarantee if you go back and listen to them again in their entirety, you're going to hear something you didn't hear on the first time around. You can do that through any podcast provider or going directly to our site at workingranchradio.com. The Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine, branded number one by America's Ranchers. I'm your host, Justin Mills, and until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long.